Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Operations Director of Soul Strategies, Amani Wells Onyoha. Amani, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Happy to be back. We get together every few months and we do a sort of pulse check on the Democratic Party, on 2024 in general. This time is no different. Some news broke last week that Congressman Dean Phillips, he's a Democrat, is challenging Joe Mm -hmm. Biden in 2024. What's your take? I watched a bunch of his interviews and I am pleased to see him entering the race. I think he's providing a fresh perspective. He's younger, which is something that a lot of voters were concerned about as far as Biden's longevity. He has a lot of new innovative ideas. He's challenging the corporations, which we don't really often see, um, where he's challenging campaign finances. He wants to bring the party together. He wants to talk peace. Um, And it's just kind of seeming like something that a lot of voters were looking for on the Democratic ticket. I know we spoke about this before, but a lot of people were feeling kind of forced into one category. So it's nice to see somebody step up and provide a different option for people, especially somebody who's interested in breaking the status quo and being a new face to the leadership of the party. I want to talk about that even further because he did compliment Joe Biden. He believes Joe Biden did a great job, Mm -hmm. but he's looking to the future. And he talked about poll numbers and he said this, quote, so clearly saying that we're going to be facing an emergency next November. He said that about polls. Do you agree with him? Do you think Democrats are facing an emergency come November 2024? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not looking great. The poll numbers have been begging for somebody else to hop into this race for almost a year now, his poll numbers, as far as the party is concerned and as far as who they want to represent their party leadership, the voters of the Democratic Party, he hasn't gotten a lot of support. So seeing those numbers and he, I believe in one of his interviews, he was also saying how he just doesn't believe that he Biden has the wherewithal to defeat Trump in this election. And ultimately, that's what the party wants. And that's what the party needs. They want to maintain that presidential leadership. So it makes sense that he's throwing his hat in the ring to potentially get voters more um, excited to come out and turn out to the polls. I want to talk about polls because I haven't seen any national polls with Dean Phillips yet in there, but he did just announce Mm -hmm. last week. But President Biden and former President Trump in head to heads, recent polls, they're tied. So what do you Mm -hmm. make of that? And what message is that sending to the Democratic Party? It's so it's showing a very weak party, because if you're keeping up with what's going on with Donald Trump, he's not doing well. He has nearly 100 federal indictments. He is a criminal and he is not a popular um, leader as far as this country is concerned. And to see somebody with a reputation like that, to see somebody who is currently facing gag orders and literal federal crimes and state and local crimes all over this country, to be neck and neck with a president, an incumbent president, is that is certainly fearful or it should provide the it should make the Democratic Party be fearful of where they stand with the American people. So that neck and neck number does not look good, especially when you have somebody who has a quote unquote clean record going against an admitted criminal. I want to talk about the issues facing voters because I've talked to lawmakers from both sides of the aisle. But when I talk to Republicans, they really dunk on Democrats when it comes to a slew of issues, including inflation and the border. They even pose a question like, was your life better when Donald Trump was president or Joe Biden? So how do Democrats fight back on this type of messaging? It's going to be, and the thing is, we've had years, right? We've been under Biden's presidency going on three years now, and he had the opportunity to present tangible results for voters. And unfortunately, at this point in his administration, he hasn't done his best to give those voters those tangible things to look to. When you look at the economy, all they know is, under this economy, I'm not doing well. The average cost that Americans have to make right now to in order to buy a starter home is $116,000 a year, which is... A, insane statistic to know that's under his leadership so the numbers just aren't looking good and in order to combat that he would have had to present some other option some sort of either with his um, student loan forgiveness or maybe some type of rental market cap or something would have needed to be done so that we can be like okay well at least he did this for us or at least although this is this way, he passed this bill or this law, and he doesn't have a lot of those things to point to right now. So as far as his campaign goes, his campaign messaging, I haven't really seen anything strong enough to combat just the facts and the reality that most Americans are facing right now as far as how difficult it is to live in this economy. 
You're working on campaigns for both Election Day next week as well as 2024 mm -hmm. in general. So what's on your radar right now? What's surprising you, A, and B, what are voters saying? Voters are feeling it in their pockets. I think the economy is going to be the number one issue in 2024 because we, as far as even my generation, millennials, we've grown up in a really bad economy. We've seen the housing market crash in 2008. And even me, as somebody in their 30s, haven't seen the economy this bad in years and years and years. And that's what a lot of Americans are facing. So this is going to be an issue that whoever runs, whoever is going to be on the center stage, has to have solutions that alleviate the pain that that people are feeling in their pockets right now and provides access for them to have a better, more comfortable way of living. I think that's going to be the number one issue on the ballot, especially as it pertains to gas and living, grocery stores, inflation. I mean, it's all around us. We can all feel it. Um, and that's going to be something that needs to be addressed. And it's something that affects every single voter. I mean, every single American needs to go to the grocery store, needs to put either gas on their in their car or pay for public transportation, pay for groceries, things like that. I do want to ask you one more question about Dean Phillips, though. Do you think mm -hmm. him and President Biden should have a debate? Absolutely. Absolutely. I know that they are probably not going to want to have a debate as far as the DNC is concerned because they see Biden as the guy. Um, but I think it would be a disservice for Americans if they don't at least give them the opportunity to exchange ideas and let the American people decide who they want to represent them. At the end of the day, this is still a democracy and true democracy means giving Americans the, um, the opportunity to have a voice and to really see the information for what it is and make a decision that they think suits their needs the best. So in order for us to uphold that democracy in the way that the Democratic Party claims that they want to, I think it's important to give him an opportunity to speak to re directly to voters on a stage with Biden so they can compare and contrast who makes the most sense for them in their vote. That The likelihood of that happening seems slim to none right now. So as we yeah. sit here, obviously this can change. Anything can change from now till Election Day. But the two front runners. Mm -hmm. President Trump, former or uh, former President Trump, President Biden, so, and they are tied right now in the polls. So how do you think Democrats need to e change their messaging to eke out a victory here? I think the one of the other bigger issues is um, the things that are going on in Gaza and between Gaza and Israel. And the spending is going to be an issue, I believe, for a lot of voters in 2024 because our pockets are hurting so severely here. So if Democrats were to pivot their messaging around that issue, um, pivot their spending, that's going to be something that needs to be addressed, too, because plainly Americans are going to see, oh, we're giving these bills to Ukraine, we're giving these bills to Israel. Meanwhile, while there are people struggling and living in their cars in the U.S. That's under a Democratic presidency. So those are going to be things that he has to answer for. So the party should be mindful of those things and and see if they can come up with some sort of cover solutions, some type of shield or some sort of plan, because those questions are going to come from voters. Let's talk about Israel, because immediately after Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel, President Biden essentially said, Israel, we are standing unequivocally with you. Many lawmakers mm -hmm. from both sides of the aisle, Democrats included, agreed with President Biden. Some did not. Some Democrats are vocal in disagreeing with President Biden, including uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib. There are obvious mm -hmm. divisions when it comes to Israel and the Democratic Party. So what do you make of those? Yes. So I believe the Democratic Party is severely underestimating the effect that this conflict is going to have on the 2024 election. People are seeing what's happening overseas, and a lot of Middle Eastern Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans have decided that they will not be voting for Biden in 2024 because they believe that they are not being supported or they are not being protected. So that miscalculation could cost him a lot of votes, not just from that community, but from a lot of American um, Jewish people in this country. Our speaking out against the um, abuse that the Palestinians are facing overseas. Um, a lot of progressive and left-leaning voices in this country are taking a stand on the issue that doesn't align with the stance that the White House has taken. So those are things that they really need to consider when going in 2024, because some of these big brackets of voters, specifically youth voters, people who are 25 and under, have very strong feelings on this conflict. And if the party doesn't start to listen or even entertain the idea of a ceasefire or peace 
in the Middle East, they're going to lose a giant bracket of voters who um, historically do come out and support this party. All the Republicans have to do, honestly, is come out and say, we should do a ceasefire or come out and say, we should stay out of this conflict. And they're going to win a lot of supports that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. And I think that's something that the Democratic Party truly needs to consider going into this election cycle. What's interesting is Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State, she recently said in an interview that what people don't understand about if there is a ceasefire, that only emboldens Hamas. She has been an icon in the Democratic Party for years now. So what, where do you think this disconnect is between some Democrats saying we stand with Israel and other ones not so much? I think that a lot of Democratic leaders are just trying to hold on to the allyship that we've developed with the, with the government of Israel. And instead of looking at the situation for what it is, the numbers that are coming out from the conflict are frankly very difficult to ignore. Um, even the IDF themselves confirmed that out of the, I believe it's 85,000, excuse me, 8,500 um, citizens of Gaza that have been killed in this conflict, only 13 are confirmed Hamas militants. Those numbers are insane to even digest in here. So as far as advocating for a ceasefire, or at least advocating for a more strategic military plan to go in and capture the specific Hamas militants who you are looking for, and to mitigate the amount of civilian deaths is going to be really crucial in order for the Democratic Party to remain um, or re to retain their support here in the United States, because it's dwindling by the day. I do want to talk about the rise in anti-Semitism we've seen worldwide and even in the United mm -hmm. States, a lot at universities and a lot at elite universities, including Harvard, Cornell, amongst others. What's your take on those? Because a lot of th this anti-Semitic behavior is coming from people who consider themselves progressive. So what do Democrats need to do to weed this out? I think it's important for um, especially people watching this conflict to listen to the voices of Jewish Americans, because for some reason, people who are criticizing the regime that is the right wing, excuse me, the right wing regime that's happening in Israel, when people criticize the Israeli government, it kind of conflates to criticizing Jewish people or the culture of Jewish people. And that's not the same thing, much like when people criticize Hamas, they conflate that with Palestinian civilians. They're not the same things. So breaking that up and understanding, hey, I can criticize the government of Israel without attacking Jewish people because the government of Israel and Jewish people, they're two separate entities. There are Jewish people who live in that country, but they do not run the country. And just being specific about that language and being specific about who it is that you're criticizing and for what reasons um, is important because this isn't a cultural debate. And on either side, when we villainize the Palestinians for you know being victims of this dictatorial regime that they're living under, Hamas, you know, they had elections 18 years ago, and most of the citizens in Gaza are under the age of 18. So they're suffering under this leadership, just like, you know, a lot of other people have suffered under some crazy leaderships in the past. So just being able to make those specificities clear um, when you're talking about this issue is really important because we don't want it to turn into a religious or um, an ethnic type of war, an ethnic type of um, dissension. It's about government and it's about civilians versus um, a government. And that's what we need to talk about it through that lens. What are you looking for next? I know I said earlier election week for you or election day rather is next week. Mm -hmm. There's also 2024 coming up. So what is what are you looking out for next? Ooh, I'm looking to see how this Phillips fellow does. I'm excited to see if he is able to debate. Um, I'm excited to see some of the people who throw their hat in the ring in 2024. I know that we have the House currently. We're not the House. We've lost the House. We want to regain the House. So I'm interested in seeing the Democrats' strategy for that in 2024. And I'm interested to see how they take over some of these Senate seats so they can have a majority again, if that's possible, and if they're able to retain the presidency. I think this is one of the most exciting elections that I've seen in my lifetime and years. The stakes are very, very high. So I know a lot of stuff is going to happen, a lot of chaos, but hopefully a lot of good things will come out of this election cycle as well. Amani, thank you per usual for joining me. I appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me.